Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. Greetings, dear young people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I think I'm going to go by that clock back there instead of this one over here. I like it better. I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you, you were in bed by nine o'clock last night? Let me see your hands. Oh, you get a star. <laughs> How many of you are in bed by 9.30? Good. 10 o'clock. Good. 10.30. How many of you got to bed after 11? <laughs> All right, line up. We've got a blue paddle for you. <clears throat> after 12, don't you know you were... Sub we gave you the night off so you could rest. But you know, we've been doing this for 10 years and it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> Don't tell the next year's students that. <laughs> God bless you all. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come to you in Jesus' name again this morning. Lord, we come with that sweet little picture of those two little boys on their knees yesterday with that water dripping on their heads. Oh God, I want that for all the little boys and all the little girls that are represented in this room, dear God. I want that for all of them, Father. And Father, these next two sessions have very much to do with whether those drops ever drop on the lives of the little children that shall come. So help us, dear God, this day. Give the young people open hearts, ready minds, and yielded wills today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we saw yesterday the beautiful vision of a godly home and you may be saying by now, or I hope you are, as I finished the session yesterday, I challenge you to prepare that surely we would understand that we will not get something that beautiful without some kind of preparation. And so I challenge you to prepare. So maybe... The question naturally arises in our hearts this morning, how do I prepare? And my goal for the next two sessions is to engage your hearts with a willingness to go home and prepare. And I'm very serious about this. 
It should affect the next five years of your life. Some of you, some of you I know, you may be married before this next Bible school a year from now. But it should engage your heart, many of you, for the next five years. As we begin to prepare, you will find that your personal vision will increase as you prepare. As your mind is set upon these things, as you begin to peruse the future of your life, uh, your, your, your partner, your, your, your family, as you begin to think upon these things and you begin to make applications in your life and you, you begin to prepare yourself with purpose, your vision will increase. I assure you, God has provided... Whether you understand it yet or not, God has provided a training ground for you young people, a school, a classroom. And by the way, He always does. He always does. In His wisdom, tucks away a school, a classroom, a place, a time where you can be preparing before you get to that place where you enter into these holy responsibilities. But God has provided a classroom whereby, if you will give yourself to it, it will beautifully prepare you for the future. We will be looking at several practical areas of your lives in the next two days. And surely you would understand that we would get out of the heavenlies and come down to the earth before we get done with these sessions. Where is this school? And how do I sign up for the classes to prepare for a godly home? Well, these classes take place in the home where you live. Your father, your mother, your sisters, your brothers. The classroom may be the job that you have. Your boss. The workers that you work with. The classroom is the church that you're in. The ministers, the brothers, the sisters. And the classroom is your own life and how you order it for the next five years. This is the classroom that God is inviting you into that you can prepare. And I pray by God's grace that I can change your perspective on some very ordinary parts of your lives. That's my prayer. God, change their perspectives on the regular ordinary things of their life. Listen to this quote. I don't know who gave it. I modified it a bit, but listen to this. It's so beautiful and true. Vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. But vision with action brings beautiful reality. Vision with action brings beautiful reality. And that's what I want for you. Beautiful reality. Young people, I believe how you receive and respond to the next two days of teachings will tell the story of your home someday. I believe that. And I know that is a rather sobering thought, but it's true. If somehow 
as you listen to the things that I'm going to say to you the next two days, if your heart says, I don't like what he's saying. I don't think he's right. He's too extreme. If you go away with those kind of attitudes and responses, I can tell you what your home will be like. It is a rather sobering thought, but it's true. However, it doesn't have to be a sad thought, because how you receive and respond can be the most exciting, joyful experience of the days to come and a beautiful home at the end of that road. See, it can be that way too. You can open your heart and say, Oh, I didn't see that right. I was blind in that area, but I'm going to enter in with all of my heart from here forth. You can do it that way. And it has an exciting result. There are many, many blessings, young people, hidden in the practical areas that we're going to speak about in the next two days. And those blessings which you can receive if you will enter into what I'm going to challenge you on, those are the blessings by which you pass on to the next generation. Ha! Did you get that? Oh, young people, it's not just God in some mysterious way dumping some mysterious blessing on you that you turn around and give to the next generation. No, these blessings, they have shoe leather on them. They're reality. They're where you live every day, young people. But you can obtain the blessings... And you shall shower them on the next generation. I promise you, they will be blessed if you will hear. Dear young people, it is an exciting get to Christianity. It's not a have to Christianity. It is a get to. I get to. And if it's have to, there's something major wrong. And I would just encourage you, you get through this weekend. You get through. You get on the other side that you can now look at your Christian life and say, I get to. I get to. Not I have. Maybe you even came to the Bible school that way. Maybe you had to come. Oh, I pray God translate your have to into a glorious, fulfilling get to before the week is out. That's what I want for you. And there are many others here also that want that for you. Many of your fellow classmates, they want that for you because they have tasted themselves and the honey tastes sweet. And that's what I want for you. So let us look at the subjects in this divine school that God is calling you to. And I want to say this even before I get into these subjects that each one of these, I have a whole sermon on each one of these. So there's no way that I can touch it all. There's no way that I can read you all the scriptures that I would want to read you. There's no way I can do it. I don't have the time. But we're going to touch on several of them. And I hope that you will grab up the tape and take that along with you and go deeply into every one of these subjects because they're very important. Subject number one in this divine school is your relationship with your father. Your relationship with your father. And I'd like us to read in the book of Malachi, if you would. Turn with me there to Malachi. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6. We'll just read one verse. I have a whole sermon, two sermons on this verse. Chapter 6. Verse five and, uh, chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, I'm sorry. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before 
the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now this verse clearly shows that God is greatly concerned about relationships. In fact, this verse clearly shows that God is very concerned about the relationship of father and children. He's concerned about your relationship to your father, and He is also very concerned about your father's relationship to you. And I assure you, I have skinned your fathers plenty of times on their side. But now, I want you to consider your side of this whole issue, your relationship with your father. This is a major building block for your future home. You may not realize it. To you, you may see it as a thorn in your side. To you, you may see it as something that you are just waiting to get rid of. But I'm telling you, it is a major building block in your future home. Your relationship toward your father, your attitudes toward your father, your respect or not respect toward your father is a building block for your future home. Young people, you are, like it or not, you are the seed of your father. Don't ever forget that. There are many deep, deep meanings in that. You can study a long time in the Bible, that one. But you are the seed of your father. He is the one who should have the highest place of honor in your heart. The highest place of honor in your heart. In our text here this morning, in Malachi, I want you to notice two words. It is the word turn and the word heart. Because here we see in this scripture that God is about the business. God's spirit is about the business of turning. And for the, for the sake of the lesson today, he is turning the hearts of the children toward their fathers. That word turn, young people, is the word repent. It is the word repent. It's a powerful word. It's a very deep word. It's a very active word. It's a 180 degree word. Repent! And we know what repentance is. But that's the word that God uses here. He, by His Spirit, is brooding over young people and trying to turn their hearts 180 degrees in attitude and respect and honor toward their fathers. And the other word we want to look at is the word heart. And I just want you to note this, young people. We're just skimming by these. That word heart, that word represents the most powerful part of your being. The most powerful part of your being. That's why God said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's what God wants. It's the most powerful, influential, deep part of your being. And the Spirit of God is brooding over young people and turning the most powerful part of their being back toward their fathers. Often, when children become youth, they begin to see their father's needs. Have you noticed any of them? Oh, I'm reminded of every one of my children and the love and the respect and the honor 
which I don't deserve, but they give to me. And when they're young, they all say things like, Oh, you're the best. Oh, you never do anything wrong. Oh, Papa, you're just perfect. And I have to remind them that someday they won't see it that way. And it's true, every one of them that has grown up, they grew up to find out that I was right and they were wrong, that I was not a perfect Papa. But when children become youth and they begin to see their father's needs, there is a danger that their heart begins to drift away from their father. This is a great tragedy. And some of it is your father's fault. But not all of it is your father's fault. Your heart, young people, should be surrendered to your father's will. Your heart should be surrendered to your father's will. And I don't have time to make a lot of applications to that. But you can glean much more if you want to get the sermon. It's called revival in your home life. There the whole sermon deals with you on this subject of your father. For some of you, it is not good with your father. And you know it. For some of you, Maybe even this point will confuse you, and I know that, and I prayed for you this morning, whoever you are, who may be facing some very unusual circumstances. I prayed for you that somehow God would just cover over you. But for some of you, it's not good with your father. Dad tries to direct the home, and, and you just resist. You're like a calf looking at a new gate, you know. They just kind of put out their front hooves and... Dad attempts to guide the home and touch your life and you just close up on him. And you won't talk to him. And he wants to talk to you and he'll throw out little leaders, you know, hoping that maybe he can get a little conversation. But in your heart, you just close up. Because you don't want him to touch you. You don't want him to tell you anything. And you know that if he can't communicate, he's not going to be able to tell you what to do. That's not good, young people. You do very foolishly to even think about marriage and a godly home someday if that's the way it is with Dad. For some of you, and I'm sorry about this, but for some of you, you've been hurt. And you have bitterness in your heart towards your father. And there's unforgiveness there. And when you think about releasing him and forgiving him, it becomes a great struggle in your heart. But I'm telling you, young people, you must forgive your father. You must do it. God will give you the grace to do it. You must do it. And you must do it now. Don't go home without doing it. Some of you despise your father. When, he, when, when it comes up before your mind, even that maybe now while I'm talking, your mind is on your father and there's this feeling of despise in your heart. Oh, young people, God must help you to get over that. You're laying the groundwork for the next generation and it's a crumbling foundation, I promise you. In our text, it's very clear that the Spirit of God is trying to turn you, but you are resisting. Maybe you didn't know that it was God, but I'm here this morning to tell you that it is God. It's not just your dad. It is God. And that confusion that comes over your heart every time you have a skirmish with your father is not just the confusion of the skirmish. It is the conviction of the Holy Ghost upon your heart. The reason why your spiritual life goes down after one of those little clashes with your dad is because it is the Spirit of God.
But oh, the joy and the wisdom that flows from a right relationship with your Father. I think, young people, if you will ponder it, you can see this is a foundation stone in your homes which are coming much quicker than you think they are coming. This is a classroom in the school of preparation that you must get in. You must. Classroom number two. Family life. Family life. What a beautiful classroom it is. Father, mother, the load they carry, the experiences that they've got under them. Brother and sister, the ones that are close to your age. The newborn baby that has just come. The toddler with all of his lessons that he needs to learn. And the little brother or the little sister who shadows you everywhere you go. Family life, young people, is a classroom. (laughs) And you may say, oh no, brother Denny, oh no, I'm counting the days. I'm counting the days. You shouldn't be counting your days, young people. You should have your notepad out. You're in a schoolroom. You are in the schoolroom which God in His infinite wisdom designed as an apprenticeship program to train you for your home someday. You are in a schoolroom. Your little brother is your teacher. That crying little baby is your teacher. The burdens your father and mother carry, they are your teachers. That sister that's a little bit younger than you, she is your teacher. It is a beautiful classroom. Do you think that God would place you in these special circumstances for 20 years and not have any design in it? Surely not. He has much design in it. He knew what he was doing when he placed you there and left you there for 20 years. He could have just as easily left you there for one year. But he left you there for 20 years and he has very good reasons for it. It is God's apprenticeship program, young people. And you are in a gold mine. And I don't know if you realize it, but you are in a gold mine as you are in your home. Did you know that you can learn and practice almost every area of child training in your home? Did you know that? By becoming a serving son or daughter in your home, you can learn and practice almost every area of child training, you can learn almost every area of taking a little child and bringing them into the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are in a place where you can learn and practice all of that with your brothers and sisters. And I'm not talking about the things that the young people usually quickly run to with their little brothers and sisters, and that is to practice authority over them. (laughs) I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about practicing 
by serving them, by loving them, by caring for them, by being their big brother, their big sister, by being their comrade, by being their counselor, by being their encourager, by being one who watches over their life, by being one who enters in to the prayers that are prayed for that little one as he's, he or she is growing up. You can enter into all of that in your home. And practice and learn and deepen the very principles that you must have if you're going to do it with your children. Ah, you're, so it's at your fingertips. The whole of the New Testament character of Christ can be carved into your very life there at home. Think about all the one another's in the New Testament. Think about the principles of servanthood in the New Testament. The principle of servant is the greatest underlying principle in any successful godly home. The principle of servanthood is the greatest underlying principle of every successful godly home. And you are in a home where you can live that out. You don't have to go to Africa. And look upon the poor, needy African people in order to develop in your spiritual life, in order to develop the character of Christ in your life, you can do it right there in your home. What about your mom and dad? What about marriage? Young ladies, you can learn most of God's ways concerning godly wives and mothers in two ways. One, by watching your mother. And number two, by serving and relating to your father. You can learn most of the principles of being a godly wife and a mother with just those two. Young men, you can learn how to be a godly husband and father in those same two ways. Number one, by watching your father. And number two, by loving and caring for your mother. By loving and caring for your mother. I hope you'll go home and do that, young men. By loving and caring for your mother. By serving and encouraging and relating. To your father, you can learn most of the lessons about being a wife. And you say, well, Brother Denny, you missed it on this one. You don't know the distorted picture of my home. I thought about you already. I do, too, know some of the distorted pictures of some of your homes. But young people, I want you to remember, if you would just reflect for a moment, we don't know the distorted pictures that will be in your home. We don't know them yet. I've watched young people through my 20-some years of ministry. I've watched young people, a lot of them. I have seen some who in the midst of homes that had some needs, I've seen the young people walk through those homes with an open and an earnest and a teachable heart, keeping their hearts free from bitterness and judgmental attitudes. I've watched young people walk through homes like that. And because God was their teacher, they rose up and became beautiful mates and parents for the kingdom of God. But I have also watched other young people who look on with bitterness and unforgiveness and judgmental attitudes and despite I've watched them too, who give up, who live in misery, 
with bad attitudes in their home and they just give up and say, what's the use? And maybe that's where you're at. It's very possible that there may be some of you in the room today who have just said, I just give up. What's the use? And some of them say, I'm never getting married. I'm never going to get married. I tell you, those statements are said with a root of bitterness, young people. With a root of bitterness. And I know you had a reason to say it, but I'm warning you, you're saying it out of a root of bitterness. It won't come out right. Some of them say that and they never get married. And other ones, they just despise the whole thing, can't wait to get out of there, go out and find themselves a mate and reproduce the exact thing that they despise all through their teenage years. You can even learn from your mom and dad's mistakes. If your own heart is engaged in preparing, in meditation, in desiring, in studying, in looking ahead to someday when I'm going to be a husband or a wife and I'm going to be a father. Now you can look at all of that and you can be taking notes and some of those notes may be positive notes, but some of them may be negative notes. But you can take notes, young people. And I think most of your parents would say, that's all right. We know we're making mistakes. Yes, learn from our mistakes and do better. I think most of your parents would say, pass us up. I think that's what they would say. They know they have failed. But your turn is soon coming, so don't be too tough on them. It's a little harder than you think. Oh, the blessings that come to those who yield to this classroom. And with their eyes upon God, they say, I'm going to walk through this classroom by grace, through faith. God is going to be my teacher. I'm going to submit to the purifying of my own heart through all of these things. And the character of Christ shall be your end, young person. The beautiful character of the Lord Jesus Christ wrought out in your heart on the anvil of maybe not the best circumstances. Classroom number three this morning. I'm sorry, I just feel I'm just skimming over awesome things. I hope, I hope you will study them deeper. The third classroom in this school this morning is the classroom of human authority. The classroom of human authority. I know that you know this is so, young people. But think with me. God has, God has, surrounded you with human authorities. He did not give angels to rule over you. He gave you human authorities. Human. Human authorities. And if you doubt that, you just look it up in the Scriptures. I mean... Your father is your authority, your mother is your authority, your church elders are your authorities, your boss are your authorities. Maybe you have a school teacher who is your authority. The human governments are your authorities. You are surrounded with human authority. Now, why would God do such a thing and put you through all of that? Well, you need to spend some time thinking about that. But he had some very good reasons, I promise you. I promise you. These people are without doubt tools in God's hand. Tools in God's hand for your life. You must 
yield to God's workings through them. Because God wants to use them to prepare you. To prepare you. If you, young people, if you have not broken through to the tremendous joy, the freedom, and the blessing that comes through submission to human authorities, you are not ready to get married. You are not ready to get married. And the failure, if you do go off and get married, the failure will show up on about day 10 of your new life. You might get through the honeymoon without it, but it will show up on about day 10. This principle of human authority is one of the most spiritual, practical principles that you can master in your preparation for your own home. The classroom of human authority. Now, I've said these things before to young people, and it's always the same. It's always very quiet. And I know why. You know, you've had a few skirmishes. And it may be while I even say it, you're thinking, oh boy, this guy, he's... He's off on this one. But I assure you, I am not off on this one. I'm not. Here's the sermon if you want to get a good deep class on it. Insights into the true nature of human authority. Insights into the true nature of human authority. That's the sermon. Young men, let me speak to you just a moment here. Someday, you are going to be in authority. As we have said many times, and we're assuming that most of you are going to get married. That means you are going to be in authority someday. Now let me just share with you a secret paradox from the Word of God. To the degree that you learn to be under authority, to that degree shall God establish your authority in your own home someday. This is one of those paradoxes. Somehow God, in His infinite wisdom, has designed it such that men and women are trained to be in authority by the experiences they walk through when they are under authority. And it's a class sometimes You may not even understand, but if you'll stop and think about every test that the teacher gives you, you will see the insight. Yes, indeed, God is teaching me and preparing me for the day when I will be in authority. It is no little thing to be in authority. And young people... I would much rather be under authority than in authority any day. Any day. What a free life. Man alive. What a free life. I would much rather be under than in any day. And I've tasted both. To the degree that you learn to be under authority, to that degree shall God establish your authority. Under authority is the classroom for inauthority. If you fail the class, if you refuse the class, if you slide through the class and don't pay attention and don't take notes, 
It will bring much confusion and hurt into your marriage and your home. And you will find yourself exercising a distorted authority in your home. And the very thing that you reacted about when you were the one that was supposed to obey, you will be meeting it out. And your, your wife, or your children will be the ones who will have to live with it. Now, you may say, well, I'm having some pretty tough experiences at my house. Well, you can learn from those. You can learn from those. You can learn. Young ladies. Much of this, which I just said to the young men, it also applies to you. Because you are going to be a mother. And a mother is an authority over her children. How many times I've heard a mother's testimony go like this. It used to be that I was so frustrated with my children. They wouldn't listen to me and they wouldn't obey me. And I couldn't figure out why they wouldn't. And then God showed me. Because I'm not under my husband's authority, I have no authority over my children. So I quickly repented and got under my husband's authority. And all of a sudden I found that my voice had influence over my children that it never had before. You see, there is a mysterious authority that comes upon the authority that is under God. It is a hidden authority. It is the authority of the Spirit of the living God. And that mother did not have that authority. Young ladies... All of what I said to the young men, it applies to you. <clears throat> but I'll, not only this, but remember also, you are going to be under your husband's authority all your days. All your days. You must find the joy of this experience before you leave your home. You must find the joy of being under authority before you leave your home. You say, well, it's not going to be that way with me because my husband, he'll be different. I'm sure I'll be able to submit to him. He'll love me. I'll love him. It won't be hard. Don't kid yourself, young ladies. Don't kid yourself. That one is a deception that many a young lady thinks in her mind as she counts the days until she could get out of that house. Oh, boy, you know. Get married. Get married. Oh, this dad of mine. Ooh. And she counts the days, you know, and she enters in with some foolish idea in her head that it's going to be different now, only to find out it's the same old way. You must enter in to the joyful experience of being under authority before you leave your home. You must. And let me say to both of you, young men, young ladies, when you're choosing your life partner, you watch out for this. You watch out for words like this. When you hear words like, words of disgust, like, my dad, oh, my dad. When you hear those words, run! Young men, run! And young ladies, if you hear those words, you run! Because you will be the recipient of that distorted authority someday. 
So don't you let him sweet talk you now. If you hear words like that coming out of his heart, run! Or you will pay. You will pay. No matter how sweet and cute she is, you will pay. Number four. And this is the last one for the day. The classroom of moral purity. The classroom of moral purity. The classroom where you, by God's grace, master moral purity in your life. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 through 5 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. This is the will of God, young people, that you know how to possess the vessel of your body in sanctification and honor before you get married. This is the will of God. And Matthew chapter 5 says, Blessed are the pure in heart. And I believe that pure in heart there is talking about the motives of our heart, but I believe it also is talking about the cleanness and the purity of our heart in these areas of moral issues. Blessed are the pure in heart. And I'm here this morning to proclaim to you young people on the authority of God's Word that you can master this area of your life. By God's grace, you can master this area of your life. You do not have to live in that bondage that you are living in. God has some better thing for you. It's very important, young people, a happy, well-balanced, Spiritual marriage is at stake on this issue right here. It's very important. You will cheat your partner if you continue to live in the lusts of concupiscence. You are cheating your partner and destroying the spirit of virginity which you owe to your only one partner. You are. You are. It's not a little thing. It belongs to one. It's not God's will for your mind to run after many. Your mind to be preserved for one precious, lovely, godly, pure, chaste, virgin young men. One. Only one. Master this area of moral purity before you get married. Now I know I'm sticking my neck out. I know that. But I'm telling you, I've seen enough of them Go down that road in victory and I've seen the blessing on their home. And I've seen some go down that road without victory. And I also see the struggles in their homes. I want you to have the victory. I want you to have a happy marriage. A sweet, a spiritual marriage. With everything in its beautiful balance. We're talking about... When we speak about moral purity, we're, we're speaking in six different areas, and there may be more. We're speaking about the area of your thought life. Fantasies, fantasizing in your mind, 
playing on the theater of your mind is a very dangerous thing to do. God wants to help you to overcome that. We talk about moral purity, we're talking about the area of your eyes. Just like the Bible says, you look on a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. That's in the Bible. Thus saith the Bible. That's no little issue to God. You can overcome, young men, young ladies, you can overcome. You can learn by the Spirit of God to control your eyes. We're speaking about the area of reading material. Reading material. And I think on this one, most of the time, you just have to jump over to this side and there's a wealth of wisdom in the reasons for that, but this one I'm speaking about, we're talking about romance. Novels, that is, the lust for romantic fantasies. And there are very real reasons, young ladies, why that one drops over on this side of the room. And why the one on the eyes is more on this side of the room. And I believe it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So don't be too tough on these fellas, because they can't control their eyes. If you inside your heart are feasting on romantic fantasies, this is not good. These romance novels are not good. Even the ones that have Christians stamped across them, it's hogwash. It's so confusing, it's not a real world, young ladies. Go home and burn them. We speak about moral purity, we're speaking about the area of flirting and teasing, flirting and teasing, that is, playing at love. That's what flirting is, by the way. You look it up in the dictionary. It's playing at love. Flirting? Flirting is defrauding. And defrauding is sin. It's sin, young people. When we speak about moral purity, we are speaking about the area of modest clothing. That is, the lust to be looked at. Can I just categorize it that way? The lust of wanting to be looked at. And that can fall on both sides of this room. Right, fellas? Hmm? I want them to see my muscle. That's why I got my short sleeve shirt on and rolled it up. That's why I got my t-shirt on there. That's why it's tight. I want them to see. It's the lust of wanting to be looked at by the opposite sex. Oh, God wants you to overcome in these areas, young people. He wants you to overcome. And lastly, when we speak about moral purity... We're speaking of the area of self-abuse. Can I be so bold as to use those words? Self-abuse, that is, self-induced sensual pleasure. The Bible says to flee youthful lusts, to flee them. I know so many young people who are literally bound in the self-induced sensual pleasure, bondage. And you know what? They are not prospering. They struggle with the assurance of their salvation. There's a cloud that hangs over their face and even a spirit of degradation that is upon them. They hate themselves for what they're doing. And it shows all over their face. This is a self-destructing sin, young people. If you drag these things into your marriage, 
you may as well drag a serpent in there with you with poisonous venom in him. I know 1 Corinthians 7 says to avoid fornication that every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. I know that. But young people, we want better things than that for you. I know God gives that, but don't forget Paul said that to the Corinthian church. It was the city of Corinth was, was like a Sodom or a Gomorrah. But God wants better things for you young people than that. God wants you to overcome in these areas and you can overcome. I tell you, you you break through on this issue and God's power and grace will be so evident in your life, everyone else will know it. I've watched it so many times, young people. I've watched it. I've watched young men. I've watched young ladies wrestle their way through these issues and come out on the other side and grace is upon them. Beautiful grace. Sanctified, purified grace. And that's what we want for you. If you knew how many devastated marriages come out of this sensual motivation, if you only knew young people, You don't want a sensual-centered marriage, I guarantee you. You want a spiritual, Christ-centered marriage. But if you don't overcome in these areas, you will be heading down a road of a sensual marriage. And you're in for a lot of rocky, rocky bumps on that road. I promise you. Oh, the power and blessing and open heaven that comes upon you when you overcome in this area. I want to challenge you young people to put action to your vision in these areas and we have a few more tomorrow. To enter into the classroom with vigor and purpose, your teacher, which is God the Holy Spirit, waited for thee. He waiteth for thee to come into the classroom. Sit down, open up your heart and say, Okay, God, I am here. Now teach me. Now teach me. Let us stand. Father, we all stand before you. In Jesus Christ's name, we stand before you, Father. We stand before Him. We stand open and naked before Him of whom we have to do. And Lord, you know us. You know us all. Oh, God. We all pray before you. Help us. To sort out this message, Lord. We pray that before you. You have touched some of the needs of my life, God. Now help me to sort out all of these things in this message. Oh God, I want to be clean. I want to be pure. I want to find the joy and the blessing of living by these principles. Oh God, help me. God, help me. 